We like, we like the good congressman from Ohio as well. Um, Subcommittee on Regulatory Affairs uh, and Government Spending will come to order. We'll do an opening statement. Let's get right to our special guest witness on the first panel, the gentlelady from uh, West Virginia. Great to have you with us. And, um, it may come as a surprise to many Americans that the United States combined energy resources are the largest on Earth, eclipsing Saudi Arabia, China, and Canada combined. Moreover, America's reserves of coal, the source of half of all electrical power in the United States, are unsurpassed, accounting for over 28 percent of the world's total reserves. The United States has approximately 262 billion tons of recoverable coal, which could help satisfy our demand for energy for centuries. Counter to the claims of the President, coal and other fossil fuels are not, quote, yesterday's energy. They are central to our economy's productivity and a critical component of our nation's competitive advantage. Make no mistake, renewable energy is worthwhile, but the fact remains 85 percent of global energy is set to come from fossil fuels until at least 2035. Much of the coal reserves here at home are located in the mountains of Appalachia and are found in West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Kentucky, Ohio, and Virginia. Of the 1.08 billion tons of coal produced in the United States in 2010, 334 million tons came out of Appalachia. The rest of the coal was produced primarily in the State of Wyoming. Coal is more affordable, uh, is, is, a, is more than an affordable source of energy. For generations, coal production has provided Americans with good-paying jobs. The average salary of a coal miner is $60,000. Moreover, the industry supports thousands of service jobs. A study by Penn State University demonstrates that every coal mining job supports 11 others in the community. It is important to remember that when we are talking about this industry, it also includes truckers, railway workers, equipment suppliers, and other service employees. During this recession, we should be seeking out ways to leverage our abundant natural resources and let private industry and investment create jobs. Unfortunately, this administration has gone to great lengths, I think, to obstruct domestic production of oil, natural gas, and coal. Committee staff reported a enti uh, report entitled Rising Energy Cost, an Intentional Result of Government Action, detailed the ways in which the EPA, the Department of Interior, and other agencies have implemented policies that have the effect of raising the price Americans pay for traditional sources of energy. It has become clear that since the Obama administration failed to pass the cap-and-trade bill, it has relied on regulatory gimmicks and the imposition of new permitting hurdles to punish traditional job-creating businesses in an effort to increase the price of fossil fuels. Combined with massive subsidies for pet projects, the misgu this misguided effort aims to make alternative energy cost competitive with traditional carbon-based energy resources. In the case of coal in Appalachia, EPA has overstepped its congressionally delegated authority under the Clean Water Act and seized decision-making power from the States and from the Army Corps of Engineers. Under the CWA, Congress gave States the authority to issue Section 402 permits and the Corps authority to issue 404 permits. Congress gave EPA merely an oversight role. The April 1, 2010 guidance document effectively seized jurisdiction away from the States and the Corps to administer both of these permits. EPA's actions have created massive uncertainty, putting jobs in Appalachia at risk, threatening our domestic energy security, and moreover, it has imposed a virtual permitorium on new coal projects. Under EPA's enhanced review process, the Obama administration officials chose 79 Appalachian CWA permits that had been in the application process since 2006 for additional review. Only eight of those permits have been issued, eight out of 79. While 49 have been withdrawn, many of the withdrawals are due to bankruptcy of the operator who was not able to outlast the EPA. From permatorium on deep water drilling in the Gulf to permatorium on coal production in Appalachia, the administration has trampled over administrative proceedings due process, the intent of Congress, and the rights of States in their effort to rein in domestic production of carbon-based energy. We should not sit idly by as the Federal Government wages a stealth war against essential and job-creating industry. I look forward to the testimony of our witnesses today, and I look forward to hearing the Administration's response. Now I yield to my good friend from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich, for his opening statement. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for holding this hearing. And uh, well, you and I have had the opportunity to, uh, to work together and find uh, common agreement on many issues. Uh, this may be one of those rare occasions where we do not. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, you have my greatest uh, respect for your service, as does uh, Representative Capito. Uh, scientific research demonstrates that mountaintop removal mining is devastating to both the environment and the health of Appalachian communities. Mountaintop removal mining has created a water quality crisis in streams where the debris and spoil from mining sites have been dumped. 
Mountaintop removal mining has created an environmental crisis for aquatic life in those streams and for the most biologically diverse forests in the world, which are being systematically destroyed by mountaintop removal. Mountaintop removal mining has created a public health crisis for people depending on those streams. The research shows that Appalachian residents of areas affected by mountaintop mining experience significantly more unhealthy days each year than the average American, and women who live in areas with high levels of mountaintop coal mining are more likely to have low birth weight infants and poor birth outcomes. Under the Clean Water Act, the Environmental Protection Agency is mandated to, quote, restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the Nation's waters, unquote. In order to fulfill this legal mandate, the EPA has a duty to increase its scrutiny of Appalachian mountaintop mining permits. I, for one, applaud the leadership of the EPA Administrator in this regard. Not only is mountaintop mining, uh, removal mining environmentally harmful, but it is actually a job destroyer, not a job creator. Studies have shown that mountaintop removal mining has actually had a negative impact on Appalachian employment because mountaintop removal mining relies on enormous machines instead of individual skilled miners. The number of mining jobs needed to produce each ton of coal has been drastically reduced. Mountaintop removal mining is essentially eliminating the miner from coal mining, contributing to a decrease in mining jobs. In 1948, there were 125,699 coal mining jobs in West Virginia, 168,589,033 tons of coal mined. In 2010, however, only 20,000 452 of these jobs remain, despite the fact that almost the same amount of coal, 144,017,758 tons, had been mined. This job loss did not result from any regulation. Instead, it occurred because coal companies themselves have replaced workers with machines and explosives. The evidence is clear. Mountaintop removal mining destroys both mountains and jobs. Coal mining in general has experienced a diminishing share of employment in Appalachia as well. The cause is falling demand for coal. According to the Federal Reserve, the capacity of, of, uh, of already uh, permitted and active coal mines set an all-time record in 2010, while the utilization of that capacity was at a 25-year low. So while enough permits have been approved to achieve a new record level of coal mine capacity, there is simply not enough demand for all that coal that these mines can produce. Demand for coal or the decision by consumers to use cleaner, more energy efficient forms of energy is not something the EPA controls. It is a decision made by electric generating plant operators and investors. Increasingly, they have chosen to fuel their power plants with natural gas rather than coal. I am deeply troubled by the fact that the House passed the Clean Water Cooperative Federalism Act of 2011 yesterday. There is no doubt this bill is intended to undermine the Clean Water Act and cripple the EPA's ability to ensure that States are adequately policing water quality not just our own citizens, but for, their, uh, uh, but for their neighboring states that share waterways. Ultimately, if this bill becomes law, it will mean more pollution, more dirty water, more health problems for Americans forced to rely on these waters. But it won't put Appalachian miners back to work. The economics of uh, coal work against that. Everyone in this room today shares a common desire to put America back to work. But we do not have to choose between safe drinking water and healthy communities and jobs. I hope we can work together to help create sustainable jobs in the Appalachian region that do not destroy the very communities and the lives of those who work in them. Uh, with that, Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman, I, um, uh, I, I yield back. And uh, I would also like to request, uh, if I may, a unanimous consent to place all of the reports that document uh, scientific uh, uh, research on environmental public health effects of mountaintop mining are referenced in my opening statement. If I could put those in the record. Without objection. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We are now pleased to have a uh, friend and colleague with us, uh, the gentlelady from West Virginia, Ms. Shelley Moore Capito. Um, Congresswoman, go right ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank uh, my neighbor, the ranking member, Mr. Kucinich, too. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here before the Committee on Oversight. I have actually uh, haven't been in the room, so I am uh, pleased to be here, and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I, I, this is uh, something that is very near and dear to uh, us who live in Appalachia and live in West Virginia, uh, very concerned about the EPA's Appalachian uh, Energy Permitorium. 
which I believe is, is uh, leading to a job drought in my home state of West Virginia. I think you are going to hear from a variety of folks from the region today, and all of them can provide valuable insight into how the EPA is affecting their communities and livelihood. I think it is timely because we had the debate on the floor yesterday, and just I would like to note that uh, I was able to get an amendment in that bill that I think uh, is uh, important because it, it, it says to the EPA that, uh, and I have had this back and forth with the EPA, are you considering jobs and economy or are you not considering jobs and economy as you move forward in your rules and regulations, and I have had conflicting messages from them. So rather than have a conflicting message, I am asking that they consider jobs and, econ and the economic impact of decisions that are made uh, around the Clean Water Act. It doesn't say in the, in the amendment that a certain decision has to be made based on that, but I certainly think that it is one of the factors that we need to, we need to weigh. As you know, the coal industry is heavily regulated under the coal Clean Water Act, mandating that coal operators obtain a variety of permits prior to beginning their mining operations. The law requires that the permitting process be quarterbacked by the Corps of Engineers, with input from the EPA and, and our State DEP using State environmental standards issued under authority delegated to the States. That was the argument yesterday from the EPA. Earlier this year, we know that EPA retroactively uh, vetoed a previously approved Clean Water Act permit that had been issued for over three years and had been worked. It also, the permit was worked for 10 years. And I think it just sends a chilling effect if you have played by the rules and been approved that you can claw back three years later and uh, remove the permit, thereby nullifying the uh, economic investment and the jobs created uh, related to that. It is very rare for the EPA to do that, uh, but I think that it does send a, um, a philosophical viewpoint of, uh, of what is going on in southern West Virginia in particular. I think coal operators can no longer safely make investments because the EPA has removed some regulatory certainty from the permitting process by having them wonder, uh, will their permits be revoked after they have invested millions of dollars? The negative impact, I think, of the EPA's action upon jobs, in, in my view, is, is obvious. Uh, the EPA has been unable to give me a straight answer, and I said this in, my, in the beginning, as to whether or not it does consider the negative impacts on jobs prior to making their uh, rules and regulations in force. Uh, just last month, AEP, which is our local, uh, and certainly you know that in Ohio, AEP is a provider of uh, electricity and in your great state, uh, announced that it will shut down five plants, coal burning plants, uh, coal burning power generation plants. And the direct effect of this is job loss, it is uh, economic loss, and it also is uh, raising, and this is, concerns me as well, uh, 10 to 15 percent on your uh, energy bill at the end of the month and, or at the end of the year. And I think that for a state like ours that has a lot of people on fixed incomes, that is an economic impact that we need to consider. But, you know, the permatorium on um, coal operations is not the only place where EPA has been hurting economic growth uh, under the auspices of the Clean Water Act. Notably, uh, let's talk a little bit about construction and agriculture. Anybody who needs to move dirt or discharge water or water runoff requires a Clean Water Act permit. Uh, while many of you don't have coal operations in your particular district, it is likely that in industries and projects within your districts could be negatively impacted by these rules and regulations. Uh, just for instance, family farms. Uh, there is a family farm in uh, Pendleton County uh, that, according to a local newspaper, the EPA uh, was going so far as to regulate the type of sheds that family farmers may build on their cattle operations. Uh, they were actually doing, um, which I could not believe, aerial surveillance on our family farms. Uh, and then when asked, when the, when the local folks asked, do you, are you looking at how much this is going to cost me and where are you looking at um, you know, trying to strike that balance between economy and environment, the, the person from the EPA said that is not part of their consideration. And I think that has been pretty consistent with the way the EPA has been acting. I think their actions are, are unacceptable because they are not looking at the full picture. That is all I am saying. Let us have transparency. Let us look at the full picture. We have the natural resources to help create jobs and protect our economy at the same time. We are truly blessed with an abundant supply of natural resources. And as a native West Virginian, I treasure the beauty of our state and the clean water of our state. And I want to do what we, what we can and should do to protect our state's environment. But instead of having a push and pull where we are only looking at one side of the story without the complete picture, I think we endanger uh, job creation, our energy security, the nation. And I think it is time for us to take a better look. And I thank you all for letting, giving me the privilege of testifying.
Thank you for your excellent testimony, uh, uh, Congresswoman. And now we will get the panel set up, uh, the table set up for our next panel. Thank you again, Shelley. Um, staff can take just a minute and get ready for our first panel. We'll, we'll move right into those new witnesses. Take a look where your name tag is and jump in there. Do we have our witnesses? Are they in the is it, all right, just come right up to the table where you're we'll get we'll get rolling here. On this panel we have um, we have first Mr. Tom McCall, president of Sterling Mining. We have Mr. Chris Hamilton, Senior Vice President, President of the West Virginia Coal Association, Mr. Joe Lovett, Director of the Appalachian Center for Economy and Environment, and Mr. Roger Horton, Chairman of the Safety Committee of the United Mine Workers Local 5958 and Co-Chair of the Mountaintop Mining Coalition. And our fifth witness, I will yield to the gentleman from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for holding this, this hearing. I would like to welcome a constituent of mine from Western Pennsylvania, John Stilley, who operates AmeriCoal. Uh, I could talk for a long time about John Stilley and what he has been able to do in business, but I think the most important thing that John Stilley has done, he has been such an important part of our community with job creation and also land reclamation. And the, the land he has reclaimed has been at no cost to taxpayers. So when we look at these people, when they understand that they took time out of their private lives to come here today and share with us the situations that they face as they try to run their businesses, and the, the, maybe it is unintended consequences, but sometimes I start to wonder, of government overregulating and being so involved in a business that it makes it very difficult to, to uh, uh, operate a, a business profitably and to keep hiring people. So, John, I really appreciate you being here today, Mr. Stilly, and you have done a great job. Keep up the good work, and please give my best to the whole family. I know you just got seated there, but pursuant to committee rules, we need you to stand up, raise your right hand, and uh, we have a swearing in that we do here. So you could please stand, raise your right hand. Uh, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If you do, say I do. All right. Let the record show that they all answered in the affirmative. And we will now move right to our first witness, Mr. McCall. Go right ahead. And you have five minutes. You got the, they got the, the light somewhere where you can see them, and I think right in front of you. So you get the warning light, and when you get the warning light, Unlike, wouldn't it, unlike speeding up. Uh, well, no, I just like speeding up. Get to the finish line, right? Get right through it. So go right ahead, Mr. McCall. Thank you, Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Kucinich, members of the committee, good afternoon. I'm just a coal miner from Ohio, but it's my pleasure to come to Washington and testify in front of uh, Congress, and I really appreciate the opportunity. My name is Tom Makel. I'm with the East Fairfield Coal Company. Uh, Sterling Mining is also another name, uh, our underground mining company. We currently have operations in Ohio and Pennsylvania. We employ over 160 hardworking Americans. We have underground mining operations that mine coal, clay, and limestone, but we are still a small business. I am proud to say that we are a family business. 
My father started working for the company in 1934, and uh, I have been there 40 years, and I have now a son that has been there 10 years. So we are trying to continue the family tradition. When I was preparing to my remarks for today, at, I was at the coal mine yesterday, and one of the coal miners came up to me, and he's never said anything like this to me before. But he said, I read a, a, a Bible verse that reminds me of the government. And he told me it was Luke chapter 11, verses 46. So I got it out and I read it. And I'd like to read it to you today. And uh, it really summarizes my viewpoint of the government. Jesus replied, And you experts in the law, woe to you, because you load people with burdens they can hardly carry and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. When I consider your question, it is easy to say the EPA has been a, a job killer. It is absolutely a job killer and it is killing jobs across Ohio and Appalachia. But it is not just the EPA, it is the entire administration. They have declared a war on coal and specifically on Appalachia coal and coal-related jobs. I want to highlight three areas where the current administration has hurt Appalachia jobs and job creators, permitting delays, inconsistent enforcement, and new regulations. First, the extremely burdensome and flawed system of the permit approval process has been complicated in a purposeful manner by the administration. We have seen the administration insert EPA into the permitting process through the use of what they call guidance documents. These really serve the purpose of usurping the power of our Army Corps of Engineers as well as State regulators. For example, we have been struggling to obtain a refuse permit at our Brush Creek Mine in Jefferson County, Ohio. Mr. Chairman, a small company like ours cannot afford to keep people employed if we are unable to have some sort of logical permitting process. That is because the required background studies take nearly a year by themselves, and in the case of this refuse permit, it has cost us over $300,000. In this case, three years later, we still are no closer to having our permit issues resolved. The second major weapon being used by the current administration is inconsistent enforcement. The Department of Labor's Mine Safety and Health Administration and their actions are particularly troubling. MSHA has proposed a respirable dust standard that is unachievable in underground mine settings and continues to be unable to produce the relevant data that they claim creates the causation basis for their rule. There are certainly and importantly some very good inspectors within MSHA's ranks. But the problem is that MSHA is being used strictly as a tool to push for massive fines and charges that suddenly emerge on some days, but the exact condition were fine on another day. The third means by which the Obama administration is waging a war on coal is through new EPA regulations. Just last week, they unveiled the final clear air transport rule. When combined with another part of what I call the EPA train wreck, the impacts on the economy are staggering. Recent modeling has shown that the transport rule and EPA's utility MAC proposal will result in the loss of 1.44 American jobs, 1.44 million American jobs, along with costs of $184 billion to power providers. And the important thing here is these costs added to our manufacturers in the United States, they cannot afford more jobs. It is like an additional tax. So I think more jobs will leave the country as we raise our electric rates like that. Since the recession started, we have lost three major customers. Each of them provided important jobs and products for the economy, but were all heavily regulated by the EPA. Two of these companies were cement manufacturers. Now we are importing cement from Peru. It is an important but troubling twist that the, the Peru cement is being imported through a port in New York using funds from the stimulus. Let me be clear, this administration's regulatory agendas regulatory agencies are destroying jobs in Appalachia, while at the same time the stimulus funding has made it easier to import competitive, competing goods from other countries. Mr. Chairman, I offer these examples because they are real and they are really hurting Ohioans and Appalachians. For generations, our reasonable energy costs, powered in large part by coal, led to Ohio being a great industrial state. Now with the administration's policies, we are seeing that this change and our competitiveness decline. Simply put, the three items I have highlighted, permitting problems, inconsistent enforcement, and new regulations are destroying what formerly made Ohio and Appalachia so strong. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, Mr. Chairman. I stand ready to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hamilton. 
Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity uh, for us to uh, participate in, in today's proceeding. I'm Chris Hamilton with the West Virginia Coal Association and I appear before you today on behalf of the West Virginia Coal Association along with the West Virginia Business and Industry Council. The State of West Virginia is the nation's leading underground coal producing state, consistently averaging uh, 155 million tons of annual coal production over the past decade. That comes from approximately 300 underground mines, 230 surface mines, and about 27,000 coal miners. West Virginia's coal is the most valuable and most desired coal in the world for both electric generation and for the production of iron and steel. Our coal is shipped to some 33 states and 23 foreign destinations, and West Virginia's energy fuels approximately 40 percent of the electrical power needs up and down the entire East Coast. The coal industry is also the broad is also the broad-shouldered atlas of the West Virginia's uh, economy, supporting thousands of supporting jobs and businesses. The coal industry accounts for more than 12 percent of the state's gross state product, $3.2 billion in direct wages annually, and over $27 billion in overall economic activity. Coal is also the backbone of our State's government structure. The taxes collected for, on coal production provide the majority of funding for vital State and county social programs. In fact, together with the electric utility industry, coal provides upwards of 60 percent of all business taxes collected in the State of West Virginia. All the direct benefits provided by the coal industry and our State's economy have been clearly placed in serious jeopardy by the actions of the current administration and its EPA. EPA has gone to great lengths to target coal mining operations across the nation, but seems to have focused specifically on the State of West Virginia and our surrounding states within the Appalachia region. The agency's assault begins with the mine permitting process and continues up to the point where coal is consumed. EPA has virtually halted the order orderly processing of mine permits and continues up to the point where, where coal is actually consumed, including uh, casting a doubtful shadow, or shadow over the continued use of coal by processing sweeping revisions to clean air standards and entirely new regulatory programs for coal combustion residuals. Simply put, the government, our government today is coming by land, air, and sea to create havoc and cripple the production and use of West Virginia coal. The Federal Government's battering of the industry literally began the moment the current administration assumed office by issuing a series of objection letters to the issuance of new mining permits, followed immediately uh, by a convoluted multi-agency enhanced permit review process and sweeping revisions that were not promulgated by lawful administrative rule to the regulatory consideration of mining permits, effectively absurding the powers of the State and imposing limits for which no promulgated standards exist. EPA, in our view, has clearly abused its role under the Clean Water Act to essentially bypass and nullify the authority and responsibilities of individual States to regulate activities within their borders. They have done so by way of guidance and policy disregarding the Federal rulemaking process so carefully crafted by the Congress decades ago within the boundaries of the Clean Water Act. EPA's interference knows no bounds. EPA will tell the Congress and the public, and we have heard it here already today, that its actions target only large-scale mountaintop mining operations. Nothing is further from the truth. The Federal agency is actively obstructing the issuance of permits for surface mines, small surface mines with absolutely no valley fills, with no discharges in, in, in lawful uh, waters of the State, underground mining operations, and practically every surface facility that must be developed to sustain and operate both surface mines and undergrounds, which include the smallest of haulage roads. Reduced to its essence, what you have is EPA avoiding the rulemaking process and lawful boundaries of its authorities under the Clean Water Act to impose the most stringent, impractical, if not impossible to meet standards against a selected industry 
in a handful of states. Despite repeated pleas and requests from our executive, our industry officials, both labor and management, our legislative branch of government, to engage in a professional discussion of these critical issues, EPA has simply thumbed their nose at every single elected official within our state and has told us repeatedly they have no interest whatsoever to, uh, with respect to the jobs or the economic uh, consequences of, of mining. So egregious is EPA's behavior that state regulatory authorities, including West Virginia, have sued their federal counterpart over just, its abuses of Mr. power Mr. Hamilton, if you in just, federal court. If you could just conclude here briefly. You can finish. You have got a couple sentences there, but we, we just conclude quickly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Resolution of this issue cannot wait for judicial, uh, <coughs> judicial adjudication. Every day the permitting back, backlog at the core and EPA grows. And today that, that universe of paralyzed permits is nearly approaching 1,000 with respect to all permitting actions that must, must occur in order to sustain our viability. The mine of coal is so significant. Mr. Hamilton, we will we'll, we'll get, we'll get to the rest of that during the question. Thank, Thank you very much for your, for your, much, for, I think your very compelling testimony. Mr. Lovett. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. My name is Joe Lovett, and I am Executive Director of the Appalachian Center for the Economy and the Environment. We are a nonprofit policy center located in Lewisburg, West Virginia. I am also a lawyer who has been attempting for too many years now to enforce surface mining, coal mining, and other environmental laws that Federal and State regulators refuse to enforce in Appalachia. I learned a word here today, permitorium, I think, which really I don't think is a word at all, except maybe in uh, George uh, Orwell's word, world. But in any event, it is certainly not an accurate description of what is occurring uh, on the ground in Appalachia. For years now, every permitting agency has issued any permit to the coal industry that it wants at any time. This is the first time the coal industry has met any resistance to its permitting, and it doesn't like it. Um, I would note that no operator has the right to a permit. It has to comply with the law, and none of the permits for mountaintop removal comply with the law. That is why EPA is doing what it is doing now. EPA's actions to regulate surface mining in the region during the past two and a half years have been necessary not only to enforce the Clean Water Act against mining operators, but also to ensure that regulatory agencies comply with the law. Too often, State and Federal agencies in our region see their jobs not as enforcing the law and protecting the environment and the communities in the region, but as protecting coal operators from having to comply with the law. Rather than forcing mountaintop removal operators to conform their actions to the law, Federal and State agencies bend or change the law to, to accommodate destructive mining practices. And make no mistake, this is not about mining in general. It is about mountaintop removal. EPA's actions go to mountaintop removal. Mountaintop removal can't be conflated with all mining. So mountaintop removal should be stopped. It can't comply with the law. It is hurting the people of our region and stealing its jobs. Um, the United States Army Corps of Engineers continues to disregard its duties under the Clean Water Act by issuing permits to mountaintop removal operators. The Corps is literally overseeing the illegal destruction of our mountains and streams. For years, the Corps has issued permits for huge mountaintop removal mines with little more than a wink and a nod, and the unlawful issuance of the permit to Arches Spruce Mine is a paradigmatic example of the Corps' refusal to enforce the law. Um, in the past two and a half years, EPA has taken three significant steps to enforce the Clean Water Act relating to mountaintop removal mining. It entered into an enhanced coordination process with the Corps for the issuance of 404 permits. It vetoed Arches Spruce 404 per mine, and it issued a guidance document on conductivity levels in Appalachian streams. None of these actions should be controversial. Taken together, they merely accomplish the minimum required by the Clean Water Act. Indeed, EPA should take much more vigorous action to enforce the laws in our region. For instance, Arches Spruce Mine, which the Corps vetoed, would devastate one of West Virginia's most beautiful hollows. 
Although the industry has tried to foment controversy around EPA's veto of this Bruce mine, that veto was necessary to protect the Nation's water and was therefore required by the Clean Water Act. The discharges at the Spruce mine alone would bury 6.6 .6 miles of high-quality Appalachian headwater streams. That 6.6 .6 miles is over 5.6 percent of the total streams in the headwaters of the Spruce Fork watershed. The mining would remove 400 to 450 vertical feet uh, from the mountains and would place approximately 501 million cubic yards of overburden material in those streams. This is not an issue about procedure. This is an issue about enforcing an act that on its face has to protect water. The mining industry is destroying water at a cliff in Appalachia that no other industry enjoys anywhere in the United States. To allow this continue, to continue without regulation would be the mistake. Economically, uh, mountain tarp removal is devastating the economy in the coal mining regions as much as it is the mountains. Mountain tarp removal is capital intensive. It uses machines and explosives to replace miners. We have seen a slight drop off in mountain tarp removal lately. As that has happened, coal production has remained relatively constant and employment has actually increased. And of course, the public health impacts may be the most troubling of all. We see that research is showing now that there are birth defects associated with people living near mountain tarp removal mines. So in all, all in all, mountain tarp removal is an ecological, economic, and public health disaster that does not comply with the Clean Water Act. EPA is merely enforcing the act and, if anything, we think should more stringently enforce the act. And I hope that Congress will not do anything to limit its ability to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lovett. Mr. Horton. Good afternoon. And thank you for the opportunity to truthfully testify today on this very important subject. My name is Roger Horton. I am the founder of Citizens for Coal and co founder of the Mountaintop Mining Coalition and a member of Local Union 5958 of the United Mine Workers of America. I have spent over 30 years in the West Virginia mining industry, beginning in 1974 as an underground coal miner. During my career, I have also been active in my union, serving in various official capacities for my union local. I am proud to say that I am still a coal miner and a local union officer at a service coal mine in West Virginia. A native West Virginian, I have lived virtually all my life in the coal fields of the Mountain State, spending most of that time in Logan County, where I live today in the community of Holden. I built a home, raised two children, participated, and enriched my community all because of my employment in the coal industry. It is because of my rewarding experiences in and around the coal industry and its communities that in 2008 I founded Citizens for Coal, a group open to everyone, no matter their employment or other affiliation, dedicated only to preserving the future of coal mining jobs and to actively participate in the debates surrounding coal mining in West Virginia and Appalachia. It is in this capacity that I appear before you today. I am deeply concerned and troubled by the actions of the Federal Environmental Protection Agency with respect to mining permits in West Virginia and Appalachia. As its whole attitude concerning the place that coal occupies in our nation's energy supply mix, the EPA has openly attacked coal. This assault begins with the permit application process, which you are discussing today, and continues throughout the process, and finally to the end use of coal, where EPA has recently <coughs> excuse me, announced sweeping regulatory changes. These regulatory initiatives, coupled with the agency's obstruction of mining permits, threatens to cripple the viability of Appalachian and West Virginia as a source of domestic energy and destroy West Virginia's coal reputation as the world's fuel of choice, be it for electrical generation or steel making or manufacturing. In its attacks on the mine permitting process, the EPA has trampled the interests of our individual states to control and regulate activities that occur within their own borders. In West Virginia, the EPA has arrogantly disregarded the will of the people and the actions of the West Virginia legislature with respect to water quality, water quality standards, streams, uses, and environmental improvement. The Federal Agency has focused on insects and tiny, almost undetectable shifts 
and insect populations while ignoring the overall health of our mountain streams and aquatic life and fish that call them home. Further, EPA has taken such positions without regards to jobs or communities that depend on these occupations for their very survival. If left unchecked, the EPA threatens to strip our citizens, our communities, and the very social fabric of West Virginia are the most important source of existence, and that is coal. These are not just idle observations. I have personally witnessed the social and economic disruptions that occur when unelected bureaucrats in an EPA office somewhere in downtown Philadelphia make arbitrary decisions about what is best for my fellow coal miners, my friends, and my community. About 11 years ago, through a combination of government interference and numerous legal challenges, a large surface mine in Logan County, West Virginia, was forced to close because it could not obtain the permits necessary to continue mining the, the coal. The results were devastating. Some 400 members of Local Union 5, 2935 were out of a job. Not because there was no demand for the coal or because the coal reserve had been exhausted, because, but because of pure legal and regulatory interference. The workforce of this local union was obviously devastated, but the county was severely damaged as well. The school system and social welfare programs must lost revenue that was vital through their existence and operation. Entire communities were devastated. With nowhere to work and no prospect of the mine reopening at any time soon, some residents packed up and moved to other states to find lower paying jobs. Businesses that relied on the mine for their income, gas stations, restaurants, repair shops, and equipment vendors vanished. Families suffered and disintegrated. Substance abuse and divorces skyrocketed. And these folks struggled to come to terms with the loss of good paying jobs that were forecast to last decades. In fact, it is fair to say there are communities and certain families have never recovered from the loss of these jobs. That experience and those troubling, painful memories motivated me to start Citizens for Coal Organization. I hope the community and the entire Congress is mindful that the EPA's assault on the coal industry has really often dramatic effects on our workforce and our people. I have been fortunate to be able to spend the majority of my life living and working in my native West Virginia. Every day I enjoy the benefits of a rural way of life. I hope that my children can live and work in West Virginia and enjoy the same lifestyle and experience, but every day the EPA goes and checks those chances decline. Finally, as a lifelong citizen of the coal field of Logan County, West Virginia, I would like the committee to carefully weigh the testimony of others that do not live, work, or recreate in our communities. They will come before you as false prophets claiming to represent the people of the coal fields and or environment and offering to help us survive or transition to other forms of employment when they destroy our coal industry. Whether they be from the EPA or the corps in Washington or lawyers that claim they sue the government on our behalf, we don't need their assistance or help. We can do just fine on our own. Thank you, Mr. Harton. Mr. Stilley. Good afternoon. Chairman Jordan, members of the Regulatory Affairs Stimulus Oversight and Government Spending Subcommittee, my name is John Stilley. I am president of Americo Mining Incorporated, which is headquartered in Butler, Pennsylvania. I'm also president of Patriot Exploration Corporation and Americo Aggregates Incorporated. Americo mines coal by the surface mining method in 10 Pennsylvania counties. Last year, we produced 1 million tons of coal and employed 110 workers. Since 1978, we have completed mining on 200, I'm sorry, 324 separate mining sites and has successfully reclaimed the land to productive post-mining uses, including parks, residential communities, working farms, and forest land. Approximately one-third of these sites consisted of areas which had been mined in the 1940s and 1950s where no reclamation was, was required to be done. Americo Americo's remining efforts on these sites provide for hundreds of acres of abandoned mine reclamation and miles of streams rehabilitated, all at no cost to the taxpayer or public. Americo has won over 70 awards for excellence in reclamation over the past 30 years. We are also in the stone and natural gas business. Last year we produced 750,000 tons of stone and aggregates used to build and rehabilitate Pennsylvania's infrastructure 
and currently operate 160 oil and gas wells from the Upper Devonian Formation, all in Pennsylvania. I am here today also on behalf of the Pennsylvania Coal Association. Pennsylvania is the nation's fourth leading coal producing state, mining about 67 million tons in 2009. In addition, the coal industry is a major contributor to Pennsylvania's economy. Its annual economic benefit to the Commonwealth exceeds $7 billion and it is responsible for the creation of 41,500 direct and indirect jobs with a payroll totaling over $2.2 billion. Taxes on these wages alone netted more than $700 million to the coffers of Federal, State and local governments. Most of the coal produced in Pennsylvania is used to generate affordable and reliable electricity. I appreciate being asked to testify today on EPA's overreach into the State's permitting programs and how this abuse of power is costing production and jobs in the Appalachian coal fields. Frankly, EPA's heightened scrutiny and overzealous regulation of coal mining in the past two years threatened the future economic viability of our industry. These policies attack both the mineral extraction process through protracted Federal review of mining permits heretofore reserved to the States and the end use process through establishing unreasonable and unjustifiable emission reduction standards for greenhouse gases, mercury, coal waste, and a plethora of other alleged pollutants. The cumulative effect of this assault provides for and will be an economic train wreck in, in the next few years to come. To illustrate how EPA's actions are jeopardizing economic resurgence and the continued use of coal as an energy source, my testimony will focus on EPA's repeated intervention in an approved State Delegated Permitting Program, National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, and the chaos it's created. Under Section 402 of the Clean Water Act, NPDES permits for discharges of non-dredge and non-fill material are issued by the same by the States once EPA approves the permitting programs. Pennsylvania's permitting program was approved by EPA through a 1991 memorandum of agreement executed between the Commonwealth and the EPA. The Pennsylvania DEP was identified as a lead agency with exclusive the authority for administering and granting NPDES permits for mining-related activities in Pennsylvania. As part of this agreement, EPA waived its authority to conduct permit reviews of pending NPDES permit applications. Pennsylvania's NPDES permitting process, which worked well for nearly two decades and was even recognized on many occasions for its excellence by EPA, was dramatically and unilaterally altered by EPA in September 2010. At that time, EPA, without any accompanying Federal statutory or regulatory changes, informed DEP that it was limiting the permit review waiver specified in the Memorandum of Agreement and would be conducting its own independent permit reviews for mining permits with discharges to the Monongahela River, the Kiskaminis River, and the Kanawha River, or, for that matter, to any impaired watershed with a designated total maximum daily load limit. The Federal agency directed DEP to forward all such permit applications to its regional office. To date, EPA's Region 3 field office in Philadelphia has received 104 NPDES permit applications from DEP for review and comment. In addition, DEP continues to forward additional draft permits applications to EPA each month for review. Since EPA's Region 3 office is not sufficiently staffed nor in many cases qualified to perform the NPDES permit reviews in a timely manner, the change has led to indefinite delays in mining permit processes. Obtaining an NPDES permit for any discharge is a prerequisite to mining, so these delays and permit backlogs are a tantamount de facto prohibition of mining. Also, while the EPA's comments and objections resulting from its permit reviews vary, a number of the objections to the permits are based on what the Federal agency perceives as are inconsistencies between the application and an interim final guidance that is developed to provide a framework for regional reviews of surface mining projects based on conductivity levels. Just uh, finish up here. And it associated with adverse impact. 
on water quality. I know it is tough to get through everything, but thank you. It is difficult. Uh, we will get through, uh, we will we'll start our questioning now. Mr. Uh, Mr. Hamilton, how many, how many, um, how many permits does a mining company need to, to actually do their business? Just give me a rough estimate. How many permits you need to operate? I don't have that answer. Is it five? Is it dozens? Is it hundreds? Turn your mic on, please. I would say on the order of magnitude of upward of 50, uh, so probably closer to 100. Between 50 and 100 permits. And that has not changed since the Obama administration has come into office, correct? It's still the same number of permits. That is absolutely correct. What has changed is, well, I want, want you to answer this, what has changed is the way those permits are granted, the, 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 what, the scrutiny or just the enhanced review process, that is what has changed? Yes. And you have seen a marked increase in the ability for you to get the 50 to 100 permits you need to operate? Those, those are all not permits issued by uh, under the Clean Water Act or EPA. I understand. Uh, but yes. Uh, but I mean, total permits, you got to go to government to operate and get. Yes. yes. Okay. And, and a marked increase. And Mr. Stilley, you would say the same thing. I, I think I heard that pretty clear in your testimony. We, we go through approximately 10 permits every year as a, as a small coal company in Pennsylvania. Okay. It is taking us anywhere from probably two, two to three and a half years now to secure a permit, all the while our coal mines from start to finish only last anywhere from six months to a year and a half. It's, that, that alone speaks volumes to the dilemma that this is creating for us alone. I understand. I understand. Mr. McCall, I am saying that wrong again. I apologize. Same thing? You would say the same thing, the marked increase? I am an underground miner, so I don't have to get as many permits. How many do you have to get? As a surface mine operator, but they have a significant effect on us and they force us to do things in unusual ways. Like, for example, we have a, a, an underground coal mine that finished. We couldn't get the Army Corps permits and the EPA permits we needed for the next mine. So mm -hmm. we actually just used the same footprint that we had for the, for the, the end mine and, and uh, went down 180 feet to a lower coal seam and, that, and it sloped down to hit that. And, uh, instead, and it cost us a million dollars more because to develop that mine because we couldn't get the permits that we needed in a timely manner. And all these permits, Mr. Love in his testimony said that permits are de denied uh, if, if you are not in compliance in, with the law. Uh, Mr. Hamilton, all the, the companies you represent in, in your association, were they in compliance with the law when you were getting permits in a much more yes. uh, efficient manner? Yes, that, yeah. absolutely. You weren't breaking the law, right? No, sir. No, sir. And perhaps the most egregious illustration that we could all use is the Spruce Mine where this mine, the permitting process was underway. It's probably undergone the most scrutiny of any industrial permit in the country. It, has, it underwent about a six-year-plus uh, approval process with all the environmental and technical and engineering, uh, with EB, EPA participating throughout that period of time. The permit was issued back in uh, 2007. And this, is, this, this mine you are referring to, if I could interrupt, Mr. Mr. Hamplin, this is the one that was challenged in a, in a court case. And what was the decision of the Fourth Circuit in that, in that case? The Fourth Circuit uh, completely cleared uh, the, the, the company. And the challenge came on this enhanced review concept that is before us in today. Is that yes. correct, Mr. Hamilton? That is correct. Yeah. And who was, who was the individual who argued the case and brought the case? Who, who was responsible for the Who argued the case? What, what agency and who, who argued that case on behalf of, uh, I think it is the Ohio Valley Environmental Coalition? Yes. Who was the individual who argued that case, you know, or brought that case? I believe it was Mr. Joe Lovett and his, his colleagues sitting there. Okay. Sitting okay. There. Yes. And again, what was the decision of the Fourth Circuit? The Fourth Circuit completely overturned uh, every single ruling of the. So they said the, the way it was operating before, prior to, to this administration. There was no violations with the Clean Water Act, yes. Was fine, right? And, and that was the Aracoma decision of the Fourth Circuit, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Okay. Let, I, I want a question to the, to the business owners, real quick. We, we had this happen, um, probably it was a hearing in front of the full committee. Five, six, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe four months ago, I guess. Um, we had a group of business owners in here, and at the end of the he long hearing on regulation and the impact it's having on business, uh, what I thought was one of the most compelling questions and part of the, the entire hearing, uh, a colleague of ours, Mr. Ginta from New Hampshire, asked the witnesses, all business owners, many small business owners. One was actually from our district. He asked him a simple question. He said, "Guys, if you knew then what you know now, would you have started your business?" If you knew all the things government was going to require you to do, would you have started? Would you have created those jobs? Would you have taken the risk? Would you provide those opportunities for all the employees that work for you? The answer from every single one was they wouldn't do it. 
And I just want to ask the same question to you, Mr. Stilley, and then you, Mr. McCall, and Mr. Hamilton, for the business you represent. Would you, if you had it all do all over again, would you do it? I started my business in 1978. In no way, shape, nor form could have I ever anticipated all the impediments, regulatory impediments that, that have been thrown up by the Feds, principally the Feds. State government is fine. To answer your question, it is probably no. How many, how many people work for you, Mr. Stanley? I have, a, I have 120 men and women working for us right now. Mr. McCall? We have 160 employees, and that is my big quandary, um, and also a quandary within our family as a family business. Um, to, my, my son could have chosen a lot of things. He has his MBA. He could have chosen a lot of things for a career. And, um, you know, he chose to come and work for our company, and I don't know if that is, you know, the best thing for him. And the, but it all comes down to we have a responsibility to these employees that have worked for us for many years, and it is hard to walk away from it. But I, 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 I would love the freedom of, of not having to deal with all those issues, and I really wonder if I ever, you know, would have uh, started over again if I, if I had to. Thank you. And now you go to the gentleman from, uh, from Ohio, Mr. Cassini. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. McCall, is it? Makel. Makel, Mr. Makel. Um, in the uh, notice of the hearing, it has you as uh, president of Sterling Mining and I am told that uh, you are the uh, officer of East Fairfield Coal Company. Do you, could you help this subcommittee or this committee with this? Um, they are both companies that are in my, part of my family business. One is an underground mining company of, of coal and one is a, a well, Which is which? East Fairfield Coal Company is, a, is now a limestone mining company and Sterling Mining is an underground coal mining company. So uh, have you been an officer of both then? Correct. Okay. And uh, how long have you been an officer of both? Thirty plus years. Okay. Uh, I have here a, a news report that uh, said that Sterling Mining to pay a fifty thousand uh, dollar fine for Clean Water Act violations at the Sunshine Mine and Mill, according to an EPA agency release. This was. Uh, from 2009. Are you familiar with that story? No, I'm not. It's not the same company. It is not. Okay, then I withdraw that. Um, is it your? Uh, I want to go to Mr. Hamilton. Uh, your uh, comments on litigation over the Spruce Mine permit revocation. C yes. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, first of all, I was, I was asked a question in, in, uh, in haste uh, whether that was the Eric Homa decision. I believe that was known as the Bragg decision. Uh, but uh, uh, this, this permit under, underwent about a uh, six-year plus year scrutiny. Uh, EPA, Corps of Engineers, the State DEP, uh, everyone had uh, very, very uh, uh, intense involvement with that permit. The permit was issued in 2007, uh, only to have EPA come back. Uh, a year and a half ago, 2010, and, and actually initiate revocation uh, proceedings for that permit. And that's been it's the only mining permit in the country that has underwent uh, that type of uh, scrutiny and uh, and action on behalf of the. Now, EPA. Mr. Lo Mr. Lovett, could you clarify the legal issues that Mr. Hamilton uh, referenced? Certainly. Um, and and use the mic, please. Yes. Let me state first: the Court of Appeals did not overturn the Clean Water Act injunction in the Spruce Mine case. That is incorrect. The Army Corps of Engineers was forced to change a longstanding regulation, the definition of fill material, um, which basically legalized mountaintop removal. And it did that in, I think it was 2008. As a result of that ruling, other issues went to the Court of Appeals, not the issue of the Court's injunction. Uh, related to Clean Water Act issues in the Spruce case. The, the most important thing about the Spruce Mine, from my perspective, isn't all the procedural wrangling that we are doing here. Uh, it will destroy forever nearly five square miles of Appalachian forest and streams. It will fill with mining waste over six miles of stream forever. If that kind of activity doesn't in, uh, deserve environmental scrutiny, I don't know what well, does. Let me go, just hold on there. Now I want to go back to Mr. Hamilton. Uh, Mr. Lovett just outlined some environmental consequences. 
uh, you know, we hear about those all the time, but we rarely get a person from the industry to be able to respond directly when challenged on the environmental consequences. What do you say to people who are concerned about water quality or concerned about the adverse health effects uh, when, uh, when these uh, toxic substances get into uh, the environment that come as a result of mining? What is your response to them? I say come personally and visit the operation. Come personally and see the biological diversity and the clean drinking water standards uh, coming off that active mine site. Come personally and talk to the men and women who live above, who live below, who work on those operations and have for some time. Well, we, yeah, we are, I, I appreciate that, that response and that, and that invitation. Uh, you know, we, we have representatives of the industry here who, who are, under, are mining underground and do mountaintop mining. Now, on the mountaintop mining side, people did come personally and did a, um, a documentary that, of course, you are familiar with called The Last Mountain, where they point out this mountaintop moving, uh, removal uh, in its wake. The process leaves toxic sludge piles containing arsenic, lead, and mercury, contaminated rivers and streams fine particulate airborne matter that creates an, ep uh, uh, an epidemiological health nightmare in unlivable communities. Mountaintop removal has already destroyed 500 Appalachian mountains, decimated a million acres of forest, buried 2,000 miles of streams. I mean, there are some people who are coming and taking a look at it, but they are coming, uh, they're coming up with conclusions that might be at variance to what the industry is saying. I thank the gentleman. I yield back. The gentleman now recognizes the chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this important hearing. There is nothing more important to this committee or to, uh, to America than the kinds of jobs that uh, every day we, uh, we continue to hear we lack in this country. Uh, for all of you uh, who came here from West Virginia, where the unemployment rate is so high, uh, hopefully this hearing will be a start toward getting West Virginians working again. Uh, Mr. Stiley? Uh, Stilly. Stilly. I apologize. I wasn't here for the introduction. Right. So, uh, I would like to understand a little bit more about what it is like in West Virginia. Uh, you have been mining there for generations. I am a native of Ohio, so we enjoy in the southern part some of the same uh, activities. But you have been mining for a long time. Would you say it is fair to say that we have learned a lot, that we mine better than we used to? There is no question, but that is the case. Uh, we have mined in West Virginia, but this is for clarification, we are principally Pennsylvania coal miners today, all surface miners. Right. But the technology that we subscribe to has is, is progressed immeasurably. You, you, you don't have a, enough yardsticks in the room to measure how much progression has taken place since the mid-'70s when surface mining was largely unregulated. Well, and I would like to delve into that for a second, because uh, this hearing is not about a history of mining, and yet if we don't know the history, we don't know where you are here today when people say streams and water and so on. Uh, my partner in business years ago was from Pennsylvania, Enon Valley, Pennsylvania, near the Ohio border, and uh, they did what was then called strip mining. And quite frankly, he got a nice lake, but he had some real problems with uh, uh, the rest of the activities related to the stream in and out, and ended up with quite a bit of bulldozer work for a, a period of time to get things right. Uh, but it was the 1970s. Today, what is the before and after in what is being called mountaintop? What is the standard? Uh, because Mr. Lovett has said, you know, we are going to destroy six square miles and it is going to be ruined forever. Now, I have been to Mount St. Helens, so I understand one thing. You can blow off the top of a mountain, and it is not necessarily forever uh, because it grows back. But I, I don't want to wait. I don't want to wait the way they have at Mount St. Helens for growth to begin where uh, the ashes are and so on. How long between the end of mining operations and the return of substantial forest in a typical example that you would be involved in? Where we are involved in each and every case within no more than 60 days or by the next planting season, we have our sites totally reclaimed where I doubt any person in this room could, could or would know that any mining had taken place on that site. We go through 10 mine sites 
uh, every two years. Our average site lasts anywhere from six months to three years. And I can assure you that is one of the things we take great pride in is the concurrent reclamation where, again, within a month or two or by the next planting season, those farms, those timberlands are returned to a use that is as good as what had existed before our involvement at the site. Mr. Hamilton. Going to West Virginia yes. now. Uh, is it substantially the same? Is there any ability for an actor to basically n do it the way they did it in the 70s and sort of no. leave you with a pond? Is it the same that basically within five or six years after the secession of, uh, of mining, you not only have primary growth, but you have got a considerable amount of growth in the area, including main maintenance of historic water activity? Absolutely. And uh, we, we go back a, a period of 12, 15 years, and you, you cannot find uh, certain, certain structures that were there during active mine. In fact, a lot of the, the uh, mountaintop mining operations or, or surface mining operations in West Virginia will actually reclaim, during the active mining process today, will reclaim miles and miles and miles of the old rigid high walls mm -hmm. uh, that were left by mining operations in the pre-mining period. And we also have example after example throughout the state where you have recreational, commercial, and industrial facilities that are developed on these uh, mountain sites today. Uh, let me ask just two quick questions, then I can let anyone that, that, that thinks they can help with it. First of all, isn't it true that in some cases failed past mining operations of 30 years ago, if they have additional coal resources, are often the best sites to go in, mine additionally and get them right? And second of all, isn't it true during the entire Clinton administration the rules that govern those success stories you talked about were in place, and that ultimately, over the, the, that de or eight years of the Clinton administration, mining activities increased. Well, in fact, the, the restoration process probably reached what is today what we call the gold standard. Absolutely, that's absolutely correct. Mr. Sala, you pretty much concur with that. I, I, I totally agree with it. I can only even emphasize it farther. As I mentioned earlier, about one-third of the mine sites that we activate or, or, or participate in had been mined previously where there are existing high walls left, uh, streams somewhat in, in bad, bad repair. In, in the past 30 years, we have reclaimed over 200 acres of abandoned mine lands as part and parcel to our remining process and literally have cleaned up miles upon miles of streams by correcting the deficiencies that had existed in pre-law situations. Well, thank you. Mr. Chairman, my time has expired. What I will say on, on behalf of the committee is that uh, if you would like to take up the offer of actually visiting uh, some of these reclaimed Idea. sites, particularly those that are left better than they were found, uh, I, certain, I certainly uh, believe that the committee should make that investment. I would be glad to uh, help you with that. I think it's a would the gentleman yield? Uh, my time has expired. Yeah. I yield back. But let me say one thing before I yield to the gentleman. From, the, the audience, remember, this is a committee hearing, and let's, let's make, make sure we, we, we remember that as we proceed. The gentleman from Cleveland is right. I would just like to say to um, uh, my friend from California that I, I think that is a, a good idea, and I think it would be a good idea for us to look at, at both sides of the equation. That is where people say they left it better and where maybe some people in the community say, well, you know, maybe it wasn't better. Uh, if the gentleman would yield. Of course. I certainly uh, believe that if, if we do a, a field observation, and it is not very far to West Virginia or Pennsylvania from here or even Ohio, uh, that we should look at the sites that are presented to us, review them uh, pictorially, and then visit them. And I think that would be helpful because I think the invitation we had here is come see the effect of mining or not mining in these towns. So I thank the gentleman. In that vein, if I could, just real quick, Mr. Stilley, uh, you live in Pennsylvania? I live in uh, Butler, Pennsylvania. And, and your mines are in that area? Uh, we operate in 10 counties in Pennsylvania, all central and western Pennsylvania. Your employees live there? All of my employees live local to where the mines exist. You care about your employees, right? They are the reason you are in business. You make a, you make a profit. Your the only reason I am successful is because of my employees. And you all drink the water in that area? We all drink the water. We would be happy to come visit at some point. We will turn now to the gentlelady from California. Chairman, thank you. And, and thank you, all of you, for your participation here today. I am a little mystified by the discussion that has gone on, because from my reading of some of these documents, it would suggest that this mining has been gone, going on for a long time. 
It predates the Clean Water Act. But the sections that people are all tied up in a knot about, sections 402 and 404, are not new. They have been on the books. They just weren't enforced for the last eight years. A new administration comes in and is enforcing an existing law, and you are all going crazy. Now, Mr. Lovett, explain to me how large the amount of land that has been destroyed by mountaintop removal mining is. Well, remarkably, I don't think anyone has an accurate number. I am surprised that the government doesn't uh, publish the number, but it is certainly over a million acres by most estimates. Um, and the mining has been going on since uh, before the passage of the Clean Water Act. However, the size of mountaintop removal mines has grown dramatically in the last 10 or 12 years and created problems for complying with the Clean Water Act that didn't exist with smaller mines. Well, I mean, actually, this chart, unfortunately, we can't um, put it up on the screen suggests that this little blue area is where the surface mine production is going on. It is about 98 million tons. The other U.S. coal production is 977 million tons, and the unused U.S. mine capacity is 360 million tons. Um, how many employees in this industry? I don't know about the surface mining industry uh, in general, but it is approximately 6,000 employees uh, in West Virginia on all surface mines. Um, and it changes from year to year, but that is the approximate number. You know, there was a lot of discussion about loss of jobs. And if we could put up the slide that I believe we do have with jobs at Appalachian coal mines, can we do that? Well, if we can't do that, this is a chart that suggests actually, there it is up on the screen, that jobs have actually increased. Here we are in the middle of a recession, and jobs in coal mining have increased, even though that green line um, denotes that the demand for Appalachian coal at U.S. plants has decreased, the number of jobs have actually increased. So my big concern is talking about something that um, I don't think has been addressed yet. There was a West Virginia University study, scientific study by uh, two doctors, Drs. Ahern and Hendricks, that found that there was an increase risk of babies being born with defects of the circulatory or respiratory system by 181 percent living around mountaintop mining areas. The coal industry's response to this study was outrageous. Now, I am not attributing it to anyone who is at this table, but the response was to this study, a scientific study, that it is probably not due to the mountaintop coal mining, but probably more likely due to co-sanguinity, um, which is another way of saying inbreeding. Now, that became quite um, volatile, and I think the uh, representative who made the statement retracted it. But either it is a serious problem relative to birth defects, or it is not. It doesn't have anything to do with inbreeding. So, Mr. Lovett, do you have any comments that you would like to make? Well, remarkably, that statement was made by a lawyer. <laughs> I mean, it is a, it's a terrible statement. Um, clearly, the coal industry does what it can do to shift uh, emphasis elsewhere. There is no doubt that living near one of these mines is very difficult. There is blasting all the time, dust, water is contaminated. EPA has determined that 9 out of 10 streams downstream from a mountaintop removal mine are impaired. Uh, it is living in, a, in an industrial landscape and very difficult for people to live in. They breathe dust with uh, particles in it that are bad for them, and the water is bad because of these mines. Now, I just want to be clear, this is not about all mining. I am only talking about large-scale mountaintop removal mines. Those mines are uh, very destructive to the environment and to the communities near them. Uh, my, I think my time has almost expired. I will yield back. Thank you, the gentlelady. Mr. Lubbock, just let me ask you one quick question before turning to Mr. Kelly. Do you, are you, do you think all mountaintop removal mining should be stopped? Yes. It, it, let me ask you, let me ask you, but isn't that, if that, in fact, if you believe that that is fine, I guess, 
Uh, but shouldn't that be decided by the elected members of the United States Congress, elected members? It should be, it should be a, a decision made by the legislative branch of government, correct? It, it should be, and I believe Not a decision made by going to court and doing it that way. No, I, I don't agree with that. I think that going to court is a way to make sure that what Congress has passed is actually enforced. But just for the record, you, you believe that should be a legislative question whether we, there should be uh, mountaintop mining? Without question. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Kelly is recognized. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, Mr. Hamilton, you, in your testimony, you mentioned nearly 700 permits in West Virginia are up for renewal in the next couple of years. Can you tell us more about the effects that will be if these permits are not renewed in a timely manner? Well, we think the effects would clearly be uh, devastating. At the current time, again, there is a universe, as I mentioned in my uh, uh, earlier comments, of, uh, of near 1,000 permits of some, some type that are pending or, or must be uh, acted on uh, here uh, currently. And over the next 24 months, there is an additional 700 to 800 permits which must be re renewed. Uh, and those permits come primarily from two watersheds in the State of West Virginia that represents about half of our production. And they are not limited to the one or two true mountaintop removal operations we have currently in the State of West Virginia. But they, again, we have one or two approved mountaintop mining operations in the State of West Virginia. Yeah. We have a number and a variety of, of uh, surface mining operations, which often get lumped into the category of mountaintop removal mines. But, but, the, but, the, but the 700 permits, 800 permits pending represent the, the, about half of our State's production uh, from basically two, two watersheds, and those come from underground mines, surface mines. Uh, small auger mines, again, just the whole gamut of Yeah, and, and I got to tell you, I, I think the, the, the purpose of today's hearing is about this permitting or, or lack of permitting or the inability to get permits done in a timely manner. And then we start talking about water, and I understand water and the importance of clean water to everybody. Uh, a couple of months ago, we, we had people from uh, the gas company, the gas industry come in. They started talking about the Marcellus Shale and the fracking. And uh, just from my past background, I know that fracking isn't new, it's 60 or 70 years old, but the, the question always becomes then about water and what's going to happen to the water and how it's going to contaminate the water. If you could, and, and maybe, John, you can weigh in this too because you're doing, doing some of the, the, the drilling right now, but I mean, I think there's a misconception out there about how much water is being uh, be affected by this, and, and if you could, just a little bit about the people's perception of what coal mining is doing to, to the water, and also the, the Marcellus. It cleared up a lot of problems for us as far as fracking and the fact that it's, it can be done very safely, it can be done effectively. I think some of the problems are wastewater. It is not so much the actual fracking process, but the, the treatment of the wastewater. So if you could, just a little bit weigh in on that, is there, and it could be anybody. I can speak to that. You know, we, again, we have been through over 350 permitted mines over the past 30 years. Each and every one of those mine sites requires a full permit application. Within that permit application, most important to our regulators, which is the Pennsylvania DEP, or at least had been, is that we can mine the coal with no impact on the water resources of the Commonwealth, whether it be via discharges private or public water supplies. If we can't demonstrate that in the permit application, we, we will not secure a permit from the Pennsylvania DEP, period. And, and, I, and I think this is important because you have a chance now to, to explain some of these things. We, we talk about uh, conductivity in, in the water. And my understanding that is a, a, a bottle of water, a sports drink, uh, has actually, uh, doesn't a bottle of water or a sports drink have more conductivity than the EPA will allow? in a particular source of water that, the, that we emit. So, I mean, I, I think it is important that when you understand the overreach and how far this gets, and it goes way beyond what the average person would understand. If you could just explain a little bit about this conductivity, John. If, if one would look at the label on a bottle of San Pellegrino drinking water, and, and I believe the numbers, total dissolved solids in that bottle of San Pellegrino is 780. In the impaired streams, such as the Monongahela River Basin, we are going to be imposed, due to the new EPA regulations for impaired streams, a maximum of 250 parts per million sulfates. So a bottle of San Pellegrino is three times that of what we can put out of the end of our pipe out of any coal mine. That is pretty tough. 
Yeah, I would, I would think so. But again, the general public doesn't understand these things. And, and you know, we have the uh, bad habit here of letting the, the perfect stand in the way of the very good. And we just tend to keep pushing this stuff down the road to, to all of you in the coal business. I want to thank you for being here. But the effect of these permits not being issued, tell me, on your businesses, because I also run a small business, where does this leave you? In West Virginia, I'll offer that uh, we think it's leading uh, to a real crisis in waiting. You know, we've been in a national recession here, and, and we've been try attempting to weather that, uh, that storm as everyone else is. And, uh, you know, we, we see markets come and go within the, within the coal business. Again, we shift to some 33 different, 20, 33 different state, states, some 23 foreign, foreign destinations. And, uh, you know, the, the, the margins out there and the competitiveness is about as fierce as it's, as it's ever been. And, uh, and, and currently, this recession is picking up, and we think we're gonna, we stand to lose a lot of these markets because we don't have the next block of coal or the next reserve base permitted. And so and, and, and at the current time, uh, you know, we're into areas that are very, very inefficient, just trying to keep the people employed, trying to keep the, the operation in a state of uh, activeness as we're waiting for the next sequence of permits to be issued. So that, we can, so that we can begin to administer the next five-year uh, operational plan. Okay. Is, my time has expired. I was going to ask, Mr. Mackle, did you want to say anything about your company, where it puts you, Who'd as you? far as the, the permitting, the, the inability to get these Talking permits? Yeah. We have the same situations. Our, our mining plans have to be adjusted all the time because we can't do what we want to do. We have to do, we, we don't have it permitted yet. We're always waiting for permits. It's a, it's a big factor. And, you know, and I'd also like to say in Ohio that the, the greatest thing that I've, that I've seen in my lifetime in mining, it, it, almost all my lifetime, we've done a lot of reclamation in the state, and we've improved the water resources in the state and the stream so much in that time by reclaiming the old properties that weren't reclaimed before. So we've, we've continued to make the streams better and better, and yet we have a more and more difficult time in, in getting the permits. Very good. Mr. Stilley. I, I echo Mr. Mackle's sentiments totally. I, I think it's demonstrated by all the stream redesignations that have taken place in Pennsylvania over the past 20 years, where all those designations have, are, are to better and better streams than what they had been 20 years ago. A large portion of that upgrade is a result of the remining that's taken place both in Ohio and Pennsylvania, and I'm certain as well in West Virginia. Just by the very nature of how that remining takes place, we are required to add lots of alkalinity into the overburden through importation of limestone dust and, and other calc calcareous materials, which neutralize any potential for acidity emanating from those sites that existed before or after our mining and reclamation takes place. No. And I appreciate it. And I have got to tell you, in, in a country that right now has over 14 million, 14 million Americans that wake up today with no place to go to work, and we are talking about creating jobs, we are talking about improving our economy, it is hard for, for those of us in small business to sit back and watch all that is going on and the burdens that are being put in, placed in front of you to create jobs and then still here, we are going to go after this market, we are going to be energy producers. A third of the world's coal is below our surface. Uh, it, it just doesn't make sense to the average person is what is going on right now. And I appreciate you taking time out of your days to come here. I know how tough it is to run these businesses. Thank you so much. appreciate your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I will now yield myself five minutes for questions. First of all, I want to thank, uh, say thank you to all of our panelists for being here today and, as Mr. Kelly said, for taking time out of your schedules to come here and testify. Um, I want to start with a comment Mr. Lovett made with regards to um, the fact that you would like to see all mountaintop mining ended. So my question is for the other four panelists. Do you think that the EPA's actions will end uh, or will work towards the end of ending mountaintop mining as well as any other type of mining? Mr. McCall, I'll start with you. To end mountaintop mining? Uh, could you repeat the question? Will, will EPA's actions and what we are seeing and hearing today, will that, is that really what is going to happen with uh, what they are doing? I don't know anything about mountaintop mining, but I know that it, it's, it's uh, very difficult to, for us now with all the different permits and all the issues that we are faced with to, you know, 
go, uh, go through all the agencies and do all the studies and get the permits in a timely manner to keep our employees working. We so often end up being inefficient because we don't have it when we, when we need to build the ponds to begin a mine, we don't have the permit in the, in the summer season. We get the permit maybe in the winter and uh, when it's harder to, to do a good job and, and putting the ponds in. So it seems to me that the EPA, the government is, is deliberately working against us to stop us from mining and, and uh, stop us from employing people. So Thank you, Mr. Difficult. Hamilton. Thank you, Mr. McConnell. I, I would concur with those remarks. I clearly think that the, the Appalachian states uh, represented here today uh, represent an area that is targeted by this administration and being carried out by the United States Environmental Protection Agency to, to do everything within their power to restrict and curtail uh, productivity, coal productivity from, from, from these regions. Uh, there has been absolutely no degradation whatsoever of the water systems. We have a state that's, that pr is primarily within a, a mountainous and hilly terrain. And so every, every impact, uh, every, every earth-moving uh, operation of any kind, whether it's putting a highway through our state or a shopping center mall or a mining operation, has some impact on ravines or, or hillside troughs that, 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 that only carry or pass water during a precipitation event. Uh, we have the most stringent water quality standards enforced anywhere in the world in the state of West Virginia. And we have a booming tourism industry where people come from all over the, the nation to participate in our outdoor recreational fishing and hunting, canoeing, white watering. And uh, so, so we are real proud of what we do, and, uh, and, uh, but uh, we, we think that is all in jeopardy right now. Uh, again, we think that uh, this area is targeted for whatever reason, and, uh, and we do have a crisis in waiting. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. Mr. Horton? Yes, sir. I, do, I do believe that your activities will end not only mountaintop mining, but very much of the underground mining in our state, and not only our state, but the state of Virginia and Kentucky as well. You know, we have to have a permit to uh, store our overburden in order to begin mining, whether it's underground, high wall mining, or surface mining. And for them to continue down the path that they're on, the operators and the people have to invest in a operation where they can't have a reasonable guarantee of some type of economic benefit from their investment. They're just not going to do it. And that's the absolute truth. Thank you, Mr. Horton. Mr. Stilley? I would have to say the answer to the question is, is, is a definite yes. And not only will it eliminate mountaintop removal mining, but all surface mining as we understand it today. Very simply by the nature of delays, the inconsistencies, and the uncertainty that it creates about trying to secure a permit. And if, if you don't have a permit, you can't go to work, you can't comply with contractual obligations, you can't keep your men in and, and, and women working on a full-time basis. Thank you. You know, we hear so often um, the word balance and how important it is, you know, whether it is in law or whether it is in regulations or whether it is with government oversight. There is a balance. And that balance, and I, I look at this side of the ledger and I see we are talking about thousands of jobs, millions of dollars of tax revenues. Uh, community benefits, schools, hospitals, um, health care for communities, businesses, small businesses. You know, Mr. Hamilton, you talked about a recreation industry in West Virginia. All of these things hang in the balance. And, and it concerns me greatly that this regulatory agency is reaching, far reaching, to the point where it, it will hurt these states and these industries to the point where. It just doesn't impact the coal industry. It impacts communities and towns and millions of people. So I, um, I want to thank all of you for being here today. I see my time has expired. Um, does anyone else on the uh, committee have any other questions? I, I just want to say, apropos of uh, what uh, uh, Chairman Issa said, uh, in terms of a field hearing, I hope we have a chance to uh, go to the Coal River Valley in West Virginia, because. Um, uh, not, notwithstanding what uh, the, the gentlemen here say from the industry, th there has been pretty uh, uh, serious uh, complaints and documented reports about poison water, massive sludge dumps, floods, tumor clusters. And, and I think it is important to get that side of the story as well. And I appreciate uh, the indulgence there, Madam Chair. Again, thank you to all of our panelists for being here this afternoon. And, uh, 
we will look forward to coming down and seeing these reclaimed areas and seeing what you do. Thank you very much. Oops, that's right. We're not going to call the third panel. That's right. Sorry. We will now welcome our third panel. Uh, as witnesses in our third panel, we have Ms. Nancy Stoner, the Acting Assistant Administrator for Water and the EPA, and Ms. Meg, Meg Gaffney-Smith, Chief of the Regulatory Program at the Army Corps of Engineers. Pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in before they testify. If I could ask you to stand, please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to to affirm, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that both witnesses answer in the affirmative. Thank you. Uh, we'll begin uh, this panel by asking each one of you to give your opening statements and just uh, to allow time for further discussion. If you could limit your comments to five minutes, we would appreciate it. Ms. Stoner, you may begin. Thank you, and good afternoon. I'm Nancy Stoner, Acting Assistant Administrator of the Office of Water at the U.S. EPA. I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you on EPA's work to protect America's waters, including those in Appalachia. Uh, let me start by repeating something that EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson has said many times. Americans do not need to choose between having clean water and a healthy economy. They deserve both. EPA is committed to work together with coal companies, states, the Army Corps of Engineers, and other Federal agencies to reduce coal mining pollution and protect the health and environment of coal field communities and protect the Nation's economic and energy security. We at EPA have a responsibility under the Clean Water Act to ensure that surface coal mining projects do not impair water quality or endanger human health or environmental health. We are committed to fulfilling that responsibility because we believe that every community deserves our full protection under the law. In the last two and a half years, we have worked with our Federal and State colleagues and with mining companies to design projects so that they do not adversely affect water quality, 
so that they can move ahead. We all want our communities to be successful. Public and ecosystem health is an essential part of this equation, and clean water is the essential to the health and well-being of every American. When the water is polluted, the community struggles, as we have seen in parts of the world where people have inadequate access to clean water and are forced to rely on contaminated sources. Healthier watersheds means healthier people. In 2010, an independent, peer-reviewed study by two university professors found that communities near degraded streams have higher rates of respiratory, digestive, urinary, and breast cancer. That study was not conducted in a far-off country. It was conducted in Appalachian communities, only a few hundred miles from where we sit today. A peer-reviewed West Virginia University study released in May concludes that Appalachian citizens in areas affected by mountaintop mining experience significantly more unhealthy days each year than the average American. And a peer review study released days ago concluded that babies born to mothers who live in mountaintop mining areas of Appalachia have significantly higher rates of birth defects than babies born in other areas. In addition to health studies, peer reviewed st science has increasingly documented the effects of surface coal mining operations on downstream water quality and aquatic life. Peer reviewed studies have found elevated levels of highly toxic, and bioaccumulative selenium, sulfates, and total dissolved solids in streams downstream of valley fills. Studies by the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection and independent scientists have emphasized the role of high selenium levels in causing developmental effects in fish. Peer-reviewed studies by EPA scientists have concluded that the environmental effects of surface coal mining include resource loss, water quality impairment, and degradation of aquatic ecosystems. It has been a high priority of this administration to reduce the substantial human health and environmental consequences of surface coal mining in Appalachia and to minimize further impairment of already compromised watersheds. In carrying out this goal, we have demonstrated a constructive approach in our work together with the Army Corps, with the States, and with mining companies. And do you know what we have found? When people of goodwill work together, we are able to find approaches that allow mining companies to move forward without degrading water quality. And that is what we are working to accomplish every day at EPA, protecting lives and livelihoods. Let me make two specific points. First, EPA has not placed a moratorium on coal mining permits. More than 100 Clean Water Act permits have been approved for Appalachian coal mining operations in the past two and a half years. EPA's regional offices work every day to review these and other permits, and they work with companies, the Army Corps, and other Federal and State agencies to discuss and resolve issues that emerge. At the end of the day, the permits that are being issued provide improved environmental and health protection for Appalachian communities, as well as jobs and economic and energy benefits to citizens of Appalachia. Second, initial monitoring data show that mines that use modern practices to protect the environment can achieve downstream water quality well below levels of concern. These mining operations are designed to protect water quality and human health while also mining coal and providing jobs. It is being done at mines in Appalachia today. In conclusion, Madam Chairwoman, science has told us that when we don't protect our waters from coal pollution, our communities and future generations will suffer. The costs of pollution are borne by the citizens of Appalachia who drink the water, breathe the air, and sweep the coal dust from their homes. As leaders, we should be taking every possible step to help keep them healthy and working together to provide a clearer path for the future of coal, a path that ensures the health and prosperity of Americans living in Appalachia and the energy future for our nation. Senator Robert Byrd stated eloquently that, quote, the greatest threats to the future of coal do not come from possible constraints on mountaintop removal mining or other environmental regulations, but rather from rigid mindsets, depleting coal reserves, and the declining demand for coal. The future of coal, and indeed our total energy picture, lies in change and innovation. I sincerely respect Senator Byrd's challenge to all of us to embrace the future. 
EPA is doing so every day in its work to review permits and ensure they provide a path for mining coal while preserving the health and welfare of Appalachian communities. We will continue to work with our Federal partners, State agencies, the mining industry and the public to fulfill our common goals of reducing adverse impacts to water quality, aquatic ecosystems and human health. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stoner. Ms. Gaffney Smith. Good afternoon, Vice Chairman Woman Burgle, Ranking Member Kucinich, and members of the subcommittee. If I could interrupt, is your microphone on? Yes. I am Meg Gaffney Smith, Chief of the Regulatory Program for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss our regulatory authority under Section 404 of the Clean Water Act and our involvement in surface coal mining activities. The Clean Water Act requires the Corps to regulate the discharge of dredged or fill materials into waters of the United States, which would include streams and wetlands in Appalachia. It is important to note that when I use the term streams, I am referring to a very large category of water bodies ranging from major rivers like the Potomac to smaller headwater intermittent and ephemeral streams. Activities that are similar in nature and that are expected to cause no more than minimal effects individually and cumulatively may be authorized by a general permit. Activities that do not meet the criteria for a general permit are processed under a standard individual permit procedures, which have an opportunity for public notice and comment, project-specific environmental review, and a public interest determination. The Corps can only authorize those activities that are not contrary to the public interest and may authorize the least environmentally damaging practicable alternative, so long as that alternative does not have other significant adverse environmental consequences. The Corps is neither an opponent nor a proponent for any project. Our 38 district commanders are re responsible for making fair, objective, and timely permit decisions. Various components of surface coal mines, such as valley fills, sediment control ponds, stream mine throughs, and road crossings typically involve the discharge of fill material into waters of the United States. In the Appalachian region, these activities usually occur in small ephemeral and intermittent streams in the upper water reaches of these watersheds. When considered in a surface area context, the stream and riparian areas within the core scope of analysis usually represent a very small percentage of the total acreage involved in a large surface coal mining project. A key point is that compared to OSM, EPA, and the States, the Core 404 regulatory authority for surface coal mining is much more limited and focuses on impacts to aquatic resources. In the early 2000s, we recognized that Federal and State agency regulatory programs dealing with surface coal mining projects were poorly integrated. This was not good for the economy or environmental protection. As a result, in 2005, four agencies signed an interagency MOA to improve the integration of regulatory processes, minimize redundancy, and improve coordination and information sharing with the ultimate goal of improving environmental protection. Unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, implementation of the MOU was somewhat inconsistent. At the beginning of this administration in 2009, the agencies reinvigorated their efforts to strengthen interagency collaboration, signing a new MOU to implement an interagency action plan intended to improve permit reviews. In June 2009, EPA and the Corps established a review framework called the Enhanced Coordination Procedures, or ECP. The ECP applies only to permit applications that the Corps had previously public noticed or coordinated with EPA as of March 31, 2009. The purpose of the ECP was to provide the agencies with an opportunity to more closely coordinate on these projects. Of the 79 applications that were on the final ECP list, eight permits have been issued and 50 applications have been withdrawn for a variety of reasons. 21 applications are still pending. Since the, MOU, since the 2009 MOU, we, tr we try to discuss proposed projects with applicants early in the design process and attempt to address agency concerns. For example, thus far in 2011, our collaborative review with EPA and other agencies has resulted in the issuance of 18 permits for mining-related activities in the Appalachian districts. We work with applicants to improve the ecological success of stream mitigation, applying lessons learned from successful projects, and by conducting joint agency permittee site visits. 
In November 2010, the Corps implemented an impact mitigation assessment tool to more effectively and efficiently evaluate impacts and proposed mitigation measures. The Corps understands and appreciates the economic importance of mining to our economy and our national energy security. We are also aware of the environmental concerns associated with surface coal mining. We work with agencies and applicants to avoid or reduce these impacts. The heart of the Corps' regulatory program is the public interest review process, which is designed to produce fair and balanced permit decisions, which includes protection of the aquatic environment. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today, and I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you both very much for your opening statements. I now yield the gentleman from Pennsylvania five minutes for questions. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Ms. Stoner, I, I, I have a question on this, and, and this is something I had written, uh, Ms. Jackson, about uh, a concern that, that we have, not just myself, but eight, eight members of the Pennsylvania delegation, and it has to do with the fact that the Pennsylvania DEP for 19 years had primacy over permitting. And all of a sudden, the EPA came in and said, you know what, we, we, need to, we need to step in now and do that. Uh, and the concern is why? What, what possibly could have happened? Because in the response that I got from Ms. Jackson, and, and, I, and I'm going to ask to submit these to the record, uh, not only our original letter, but also letters uh, back from the EPA and also uh, Mr. Kranz, who is the Secretary for the Department of Environmental Protection from Pennsylvania, he also has questioned why the EPA has stepped in. And is there something that I am not without understanding objection. or something that happened? Oh, you have to do that without objection, I am sure. I'm so without objection? Without objection. Correct. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> if, if you could. Uh, yes. Thank you for that question. Uh, Pennsylvania has primacy over the uh, Clean Water Act 402, the Pollution Control Program. That has not changed. And uh, EPA continues to work on a regular basis with the State of Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, in its role, uh, which is a role of oversight. So we look at particular problems. So some of the correspondence that I have seen has to do with discharges of pollution into already impaired waters. Uh, those are waters that are polluted already, and the permit, for example, doesn't have a limit for the kind of pollutant that is being discharged. That is the uh, kind of issue that EPA raises in comments that it submits to the State. The State is the uh, permit issuing authority in Pennsylvania. Okay. Well, I, because in the letter I received back, uh, it says EPA is unaware of any specific violations in terms of the memorandum of agreement. And so it, it, call, it causes one to wonder, because this, the meeting today is actually, or the hearing today is about permitting and the ability to get permitting done quickly, because these folks that run these businesses don't have the ability, as government does, to stall and hold up and not really worry about doing things in a timely fashion. Their businesses are at risk, and the people they employ are at risk all the time. So I wonder about it. And, and, and right now, there are, uh, if, if my numbers are right, there are 25 ND, uh, N, NPDES permits that have been sent to the EPA for further review. And, can we get a commitment from the EPA on when these, these permits will be reviewed? Are you speaking of 402 or 404 permits? I am just not sure what number uh, you are here, looking at. Here is what uh, there is 402. 402 permits. Yeah, we, we do take our responsibility very seriously to, uh, to provide that review promptly and try to resolve issues as soon as we can. And as soon as the permit meets the requirements of the Clean Water Act, uh, we uh, try to get back to the State uh, as rapidly as possible to let them know that. And yeah. uh, I uh, spoke with Region 3 about uh, that correspondence, and they are working very hard to get those permits uh, cleared uh, by ensuring that they comply with the law. Uh, but uh, we, uh, we, the, what we have been filing is comments on those permits to, to a large extent, which does not stop the permit from being issued. It uh, identifies issues of concern for the State. Okay, because when I look at this, we, we have six, uh, six permits that have been waiting for 30 days, four have been waiting for 60 days, eight have been waiting for 90 days, two have been waiting for 120 days, one has been waiting over six months, and four have been waiting for over a year from the EPA. So in, in, a, in a world where time is of the essence, 
and the ability to get these permits done. This has nothing to do with clean water. I would agree with you entirely that we all want the same thing. But when we hold businesses up because we can't process permits quickly, which is the whole purpose, again, of today's hearing, I just wonder, can the EPA actually do this in a timely fashion and in a way that will allow these companies to stay in business? I completely agree with you about the importance of doing our job promptly. Absolutely. Okay. So the commitment then from the EPA would be? I will uh, uh, talk with the region and I will make sure that we move forward as rapidly as we can on those permits. Okay. Because some of these people, I mean, you know, the, the, we have one waiting for, uh, for six months and four have been waiting over a year. So I would, I would ask you to please, uh, and I know that your schedule is full and I know everything is going on, but we have to move really quickly on this. So I, I appreciate you being here today and thank you for the job you are doing, but we do have to get this stuff to move forward. Thank you. And we will look into it. I don't know the details of those, but I will uh, look into it. Well, and I, you have my commitment to do so. And I appreciate that. And we put the letters into the record so you can take a look at those also, because not, also my, not only myself, but my other friends in the Pennsylvania delegation and Secretary Kranzer from the Pennsylvania DEP would also like an answer on some of those things. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Very good. And I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. I now yield five minutes to the Ranking Member, Mr. Kucinich from Ohio. Thank you very much. I, I want to um, uh, acknowledge uh, my friend from Pennsylvania, uh, who is a, uh, a very strong advocate of, of, uh, of business. And um, you know, we have sat in many hearings where, where I have heard you, as, from your own experience, talk about the frustrations that businesses have. I was looking at the testimony of uh, Ms. Stoner. I, uh, she just had a chance to read some of it. And she talks about how uh, just this month the EPA worked with the uh, Midvale Coal Sales and West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection to develop a permit that includes a uh, numeric limit on ionic pollution for the dry branch surface mine, preserving 150 jobs. And then later on she talked about how the EPA and the Corps worked together with Hobit Mining, Inc. in early 2010 to authorize a project that reduced stream impacts by 50 percent, enabled continued coal production, protected jobs of more than 350 miners. Uh, the, um, the, the thing about, about your uh, testimony that I found striking in, in view of the previous panel was uh, when, you, when you cited peer-reviewed uh, public health literature in speaking of potential association between negative human health effects and the documentation of coal mining activities, peer-reviewed public health literature has primarily identified associations between increases in surface coal mining activities and increasing rates of cancer, birth defects, and other serious health consequences in uh, Appalachian communities. Now, uh, that is a direct quote from your testimony. You know what we're what, what I think we're really talking about here is trying to strike a balance uh, where those who are trying to do the right thing and comply with the law are, are assisted in the permitting process, and on the other hand, those who are the bad actors and they're in every line of endeavor that the EPA um, will weigh in on the side of public health. Is that, is that a correct way of describing how you see your mission? Yes, it is. And, and I think um, the, um, I, I think the American public really is interested in, in that kind of a direction, because they had a recent poll by the Natural Resources Defense Council that found that Americans want uh, uh, EPA to do more to protect them, not less. Uh, that two-thirds of Americans polled, uh, well, actually 63 percent said the EPA needs to do more to hold polluters accountable and protect the air and water. I, I think, uh, again, the, the point that is made in this hearing is that um, we, we want to create a balance between protecting jobs and protecting the environment. And actually, protecting the air and water quality, it does have a positive economic impact as well. So, um, but those who, those who say, I don't want any regulation, <laughs> those who say there is no legitimate role for the EPA, I think we have to look at them with suspicion, I have to look at them very carefully. And, and I have to say uh, to, to my friends on, on this committee, 
you know, I, 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 I saw this, um, uh, this, this documentary about, uh, you know, what's happening in West Virginia. And granted, it, it came from a particular point of view. But, you know, there are people who are suffering adverse health effects. And, and these studies that are done, they don't seem to uh, include any other possibilities other than the fact that it was, you know, the, the effects of the mining. There was no other, you know, all the other variables were ruled out. So, um, you know, as we, as we continue as a committee and as the House to get into this, these issues, um, you know, I, I, I think that it may be that the EPA is on the right track in terms of being uh, much more careful about the permitting process, but at the same time you are showing a record where people are doing the right thing uh, that, that you are trying to assure that they are able to, uh, to continue. So I, I just wanted to make those observations, thank uh, uh, Ms. Stoner for her testimony. And I, and I saw in your presentation, uh, you are you're very passionate about this, I could tell. Yeah, you really do care about it. And that, that uh, speaks well. And I appreciate uh, Ms. Gaffney Smith's uh, uh, service as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will now yield myself five minutes for questions. I just want to clarify, Ms. Stoner, with regards to permits, in your testimony, your opening statement, you mentioned that there is no moratorium on permits and that in the last two and a half years, 100 permits have been granted. Now, are those, those are just permits in general or permits for what? I, I was referring to both 402 and 404 permits, and uh, those are for mining operations in Appalachia, I believe. So what about the enhanced review? Because there are 79 permits. The, uh, not all of the permits that are issued by uh, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, which issues the 404 permits, or the 402 permits, which are actually issued by the states in Appalachia, uh, not all of them are, are part of that ECP process. So we did provide that enhanced coordination procedure process information to you. I believe it is attached to uh, uh, Ms. Gaffney Smith's, Smith's testimony. <laughs> it's hard to say. <laughs> Ms. Gaffney Smith's testimony uh, this morning or this evening. So the hundred in your opening statement were the 402s and 404s, not the enhanced permits. That's a subset of them. Okay. There were particular permits that were identified for additional review, and those are in the enhanced coordination procedures. And uh, and there are 79 that were identified there in the chart. Uh, uh, that was attached to the testimony, um, uh, it, it identifies what the status is of all of those. Uh, my understanding of two of those are currently in review. Uh, uh, one has been proffered, I believe, one of those two, uh, and there are eight that have been issued. But there are lots of other permits that are also being issued at the same time through both general and individual permitting mechanisms, and that is what I was referring to. Okay. And Ms. Gaffney Smith, could you just speak to the 22 uh, that were, or the 49? I'm sorry, the 49 that have been withdrawn. Okay, it, actually, the the correct number for the number of applications that have been withdrawn is 50. Um, we have we have 50 applications that were withdrawn, and they've been withdrawn for a number of reasons. In some circumstances, the districts reached out to the companies to talk to them about whether or not they were ready to provide the additional information that was requested and whether or not they could provide that information within a timely manner. In other instances, the companies asked for us to withdraw their application, and, and therefore we did that. And so those 50 applications reflect those 50 of the 79 that were withdrawn. Okay. Thank you. I, I want to uh, speak to um, the issue that my colleague from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich, brought up with regards to, um, and this questions from Ms. Stoner. With regards to the new information um, in, in this increased cases of cancer, uh, being from a health, with a health care background, this is of uh, interest to me and certainly of concern to me. Um, in your written testimony, you claim that the EPA uncovered new information under scientific review. However, the Army Corps of Engineers uh, said that no such review was discoverable and that so I'm trying to understand. You're saying there's new evidence. Army Corps of Engineers said there was not any new evidence. We have a slide up on the screen, um, and this was from a letter the uh, Army Corps sent to the EPA. 
It says a review of the bibliography attached to uh, the EPA's letter does not reveal any research conducted by them in 2008. <clears throat> Excuse me. The study contains no new circumstances or information that the Army Corps of Engineers has not previously, previously considered. So could you comment on that? Uh, yes. Um, my understanding is that we have five boxes of scientific studies that uh, my uh, staff have uh, copied that uh, are uh, articles about the environmental and public health impacts of mountaintop mining. Uh, from uh, 2007 to the present, which was the time of the issuance of that. And we would be happy to submit those for uh, the record if you would like us to do so. Uh, uh, we uh, felt like there was new information that was very important there. Uh, I think there has already been discussion about the kinds of environmental impacts and the more than six miles of stream impacts from that, from that uh, particular uh, uh, proposed mine. Thank you. Let me just ask Ms. Ms. Smith. Um, was there was the court made aware of this, or was this submitted for what, what I can what I can state about this activity, the spruce veto is is I have to be careful because it's an active litigation. But I will say that when the district commander reviewed the information that was provided by the EPA in the letter that you're referencing, the district commander, in accordance with our regulations, made a determination that there wasn't any new information which would be required in order to suspend or revoke that issued permit. Thank you very much. I see my time has expired. We, yeah, if uh, we can go have another round of questions, Mr. Kelly. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I just, I just thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to make a, a quick comment because I know the days are not running late. And I really thank you for coming down today. I know it's hard. Our schedule doesn't always allow things to run on time, but I did want to make a really clear uh, a comment that this really, the hearing today, uh, we all want clean water and we want clean air. And I, I agree with Mr. Kucinich. That is a major concern. I wouldn't be the last one in the world to say that that is not what we want. Because you know, the truth of this is, these people that are doing this mining, they live in the same community. They raise their children in that community. They are going to live there for a long time and they want everything safe for their kids and their grandchildren. I think one of the things we, we fail to realize sometimes is that this is a business that requires, again, as I said earlier, a time is of the essence on this permitting. And in a country that relies on over 50 percent of its electricity generated through, through coal and, and the opportunities this country has through the natural resources to be totally energy independent of anybody else in the world, we don't need to rely on people who don't like us particularly for our energy. But when we look at this and we look at how some of these companies are being held back, that is my concern. I think that was the concern of the hearing today. So I want you to understand, I do appreciate what you are doing. Clean water is important to me also. I am a father and a grandfather. I, I, I take kids out and I watch them play outside. I, I take them to get drinking water, water and everything else, so I understand it. So I think sometimes we, can, we come across as people who are making too much sense and are not sensitive enough. But I do think that all of us have the same goals, and that is to make sure that we maintain the quality of the water that we have, make sure we get the best out of everything. But also, let us make sure that we are not holding back job creators from doing what they can do, and that is to turn this economy around and get us back to work. So thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I now yield five minutes to the Ranking Member, Mr. Kucinich. I, I, I think it is uh, it, important uh, uh, what uh, Mr. Kelly just said, because um, you know, it is very easy to paint everything here in black and white. Uh, but we, you know, we want clean water. We want clean air. And I would just say to my friend that 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 when you when you see, I, I understand you have to go, but when when we see that there are egregious violations, uh, we have to follow them. And and and, Madam Chair, I, I had a chance to see a, docu a documentary on um, Coal River Valley, West Virginia. It was called the, the Last Mountaintop. And uh, again, I you know I'll submit, you know, there was a certain point of view that was that was guiding it. At the same time, they raised some compelling issues about the environment and about how about the effects of people, about the effects of the practice of dynamiting uh, mountaintops, uh, and and about the air and the water pollution, about the health effects of people, and um, and and again going back to what our chairman said, Mr. Issa, when he talked about a field hearing, I I I am going to uh, ask uh, Mr. Issa if one of the places we go would be to go to Coal River Valley to hear what the people have to say, because we, we need to see the people that are living with this and, and maybe learn a little bit about the direction we should be taking. So I thank the gentlelady for indulgence. 
Thank you, Mr. Kucinich. I have one last question, uh, if you would both indulge me. Uh, this this um, also go was in the letter, and I am going to enter it into the record, uh, if there is no objection, a uh, letter from uh, the Army Corps of Engineers to the EPA dated uh, September 30, 2009. Um, submit that for the record. Um, and we have the slide up on the screen. I will read it. It says that, uh, and this is from the Army Corps of Engineers, further, the West Virginia um, Environmental Protection Agency has advised that the District Spruce No. 1 mine is currently in compliance with their existing authorizations for the mine. Therefore, I have determined that no additional evaluation of the project's effect on the environment are warranted. The permit will not be suspended, modified, or revoked, and a supplemental EIS will not be prepared. So I am trying to understand why, then, the EPA went ahead and revoked that license. But I will uh, ask you that question, but first I want to ask uh, Ms. Smith if she has a comment on that. I don't have any comment on that. was the district commander's position on that request from EPA. So there is um, mining at Spruce that has been going on and has continued throughout. And uh, uh, that uh, is mining goes into a creek called Sank Camp. Uh, and uh, that has never been stopped. It was, uh, 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 but mining never proceeded in the other two creeks. Uh, and that was the activity that EPA found if that mining was to proceed. Uh, into uh, those other two creeks, then there would be uh, uh, an unacceptable adverse impact on the wildlife there. And that was the determination we made uh, based on all of the information, uh, the, the years of study that had been done there. Uh, in, uh, I mentioned earlier the 6.6 .6 miles, uh, the uh, impacts on the wildlife, the diverse, very high quality streams that were affected there. That was a decision that we made under 404C. I, I, but I am confused because that, the Army Corps does address that issue that Spruce No. 1 mine, they, they were talking specifically about that, was in compliance. And this was three years now later, and their, and their permit was revoked. Do you, I, it goes back to that balance issue. How do you expect these businesses to get started, to invest what they have invested, and then three years into the project, their permit is, is revoked for what seems to be, according to the Army Corps of Engineers, they are in compliance, they're, they can't find any new scientific inf you know, uh, evidence, and um, I feel like I am not explaining this clearly. Um, what I was trying to explain is that it wasn't because of violations at the mi for the mining activity that was occurring at Sen Camp. That wasn't the reason that EPA moved forward with the 404C. It was the uh, prospective harm to the streams that would have been filled with uh, six point the 6.6 .6 miles of streams that would have been filled and the downstream impacts to the entire watershed, which was already downstream waters, which were already impaired due to mining discharges. That was the basis of EPA's decision. Thank you. Well, Ms. Smith, let me ask you this. Um, are you aware that the EPA incorrectly identified the location of the Sun Camp and its concerns to the Army Corps and, and their request to revoke the permit? I, I, I am not aware of that. It's, it's in the letter that the Army Corps sent to it's in the It's in the 2009 the letter, and I just can't speak to that because that's a district commander letter, and I don't have the facts at my te off the tip of my tongue. Thank you. Is there a way that you could provide us with whether or not the Army Corps, um, and you could provide that answer to the committee, whether or not the Army Corps was aware that the EPA used, um, they in incorrectly identified the location of the same camp? Yes, ma'am. Okay. If uh, there's no further comment or questions, uh, we will um, conclude our questions. And again, we thank you for being here um, for your commitment. I want to just again reiterate what um, the ranking member said, as well as Mr. Kelly. This is about a balance, and this is about keeping our air and our water clean so that the communities can enjoy it, but is also uh, a concern that the EPA stands squarely in the middle of jobs 
and getting this economy back on track and creating obstacles for these industries. So hopefully we can strike that balance and uh, do what is right for this country. With that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.